It's my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Asquith Forum uh, on the subject of closing the achievement gap. The occasion for uh, this uh, forum tonight is the publication earlier this year uh, of a new book uh, by Richard Rothstein called Class and Schools. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, I strongly recommend it. Subtitle is Using Social, Economic, and Educational Reform to Close the Black-White Achievement Gap. Um, as I, I need to tell uh, most of the people in this room, uh, the achievement gap is um, I think pretty clearly the most uh, persistent troubling uh, problem in American uh, education. Um, people can argue about um, the magnitude of the gap. Uh, in some ways, the best way to dramatize it, I think, is the if we'd had an audiovisual uh, display behind us, I would have put up these trend line data that most of you have probably seen from the National Assessment of Education Progress, showing that whatever the, the, the ups and downs in reading and mathematics achievement, what's striking about the lines, if you look at uh, African American, Latino, and white uh, performance uh, on the national assessment, uh, is that the three lines are almost identical, except for the fact. Uh, that the white line uh, reflects the uh, academic uh, achievement and performance of 13-year-old uh, students, uh, excuse me, of 17-year-olds, uh, while the African-American and Latino lines uh, reflect uh, uh, the performance of 17-year-olds. Um, this evening, uh, we're going to begin with uh, Richard sort of laying out the main argument uh, of uh, his book, um, after which we'll have comments um, from three people who bring uh, extraordinary experience and perspectives uh, to this conversation. Um, uh, first, uh, Dan Kortz, uh, as many of you know, a uh, member of uh, the uh, GSE faculty here, um, whose uh, research uh, over the years has focused uh, fairly heavily um, on um, assessment, uh, on achievement results, and particularly on uh, analyzing uh, the achievement gap. Uh, second, uh, Donna Rodriguez, the uh, founding principal of the University Park uh, Campus uh, School, high school in Worcester that, again, as many of you probably know, is the uh, highest achieving uh, urban high school uh, in the state, uh, serving a heavily uh, Latino population. Uh, Donna now is a program director at Jobs for the Future, where uh, she is working with uh, schools across the country to share the uh, knowledge uh, and practice uh, uh, skills that uh, uh, she and her colleagues at University Park uh, have <coughs> developed uh, over the years. Um, our final respondent is Ron Ferguson, uh, faculty member uh, at the Kennedy School, um, both uh, a uh, prominent researcher uh, in this topic, but also uh, a, a practitioner himself, uh, somebody who has worked closely uh, with a set of school districts around the country on strategies to try to uh, narrow uh, the gap in, uh, in performance. Um, after uh, uh, Richard speaks, and then with short um, responses uh, from our three respondents, we'll give Richard an opportunity to comment uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the comments of the respondents, and then we will open up the floor for discussion. Um, Richard Rothstein, I think, as uh, uh, many of you know, has had a long-time relationship as a senior research person at the Economic Policy Institute uh, in D.C. Uh, he is... Um, uh, this year and uh, last year, a visiting fellow uh, at Teachers College, uh, Columbia University. I suspect he's probably best known to people in this room for his uh, three years as the first uh, education columnist of the New York Times. Um, columnists, unlike uh, researchers, uh, um, uh, needn't be fair, um, and they are more than entitled to their opinions. Um, <laughs> Richard, uh, uh, I didn't always uh, agree with his, uh, with his opinions, but I always found him in my interactions with him uh, uh, a model of fairness, uh, uh, somebody willing to listen, and most importantly, somebody who was scrupulous about getting the facts right. Uh, without any further uh, introduction, uh, please welcome Richard Rothstein. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, I like to think it was a column of analysis, not opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for um, being here this evening. Uh, as Bob said, I, I wrote a book this last year called Class and Schools, and the point of the book, which I will try to describe briefly to you, was to argue that a society with social class differences 
must have differences in average achievement of children from different social classes. We now have a national education goal. In fact, it's more than a goal, it's a requirement written in law that 10 years from now, in 2014, we will have no achievement gap. All children, uh, children of, of each racial and ethnic group, children of each of two broadly defined social classes, those who receive free and reduced lunch and those who are above that level, will all be proficient with a high standard of proficiency uh, in the chief academic subjects. And what I want to suggest to you is that that's an impossible goal. It's a goal that can't be met. It's a goal that we should not expect to be met. And that, in fact, having such a goal is enormously destructive uh, to public education in this country. Now, why do I say that, that we can't close the achievement gap and should not expect to close the achievement gap? Most people say that, well, uh, the color of your skin or how much money your parents have should not affect how much you can learn or how effective a teacher is. And therefore, if children don't come out of school with similar achievement on average, uh, regardless of the color of their skin or how much money their parents have, it must be because schools are not doing equally effective jobs with all kinds of children. That seems to be common sense. And the reason I wrote the book and the reason I want to make this, this presentation to you is that I think there's actually an opposite case that makes much more common sense. And it's very difficult to argue the powerful influence of social class and student achievement if it doesn't make common sense to people. So I want to describe in, in the next 20 minutes or so um, why it does make uh, great common sense that social class differences could, should, even in the best of schools, result in different average achievement for children. Now, before I, I do that, I want to try to sweep aside, if I can, some common misconceptions that prevent us from analyzing um, the relationship between social class and, and educational achievement carefully. The first misconception was uh, actually articulated very often in response to the uh, uh, Coleman report that came out almost 40 years ago, which found to Coleman's own consternation that uh, student background characteristics had a greater influence on the variation and the achievement of children in schools than the effectiveness of schools themselves. And people threw up their hands and said, well, that means that schools don't make a difference, must not make a difference. And uh, uh, to re in response to that, one of the defenders of the, the report, the, the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, um, said, he says, that's nonsense. Of course schools make a difference. Children don't learn algebra on their own. And I want to emphasize that he's right. Of course schools make a big difference. I am not suggesting that schools don't make a difference. The quality of schools has an enormous influence on how much children on average learn. They have an enormous influence on the average achievement of children. Student background characteristics have much more of ability to predict the variation of student achievement. In other words, whether children learn algebra has mostly to do with how good schools are. Which children learn algebra better than others has much more to do with their social class backgrounds. And if we can keep that distinction in mind, I think that it makes it easier to not be confused by discussions of the, the test score gap. The second misconception that I, I want to discuss is one that's come upon us in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. We used to measure student achievement in this country primarily with norm reference tests, and I assume that, that most of you here at the Graduate School of Education know what I'm talking about when I talk about norm reference tests. In other words, we described how the achievement of, of a child or a group of children um, can be described compared to the achievement of other children. 
and usually norm-reference results are reported in percentile ranks. Well, what we've done in the last 15 to 20 years is we've um, developed the idea that we really shouldn't want to know how children do relative to one another. We want to know absolutely how much they learn. And so we've switched to reporting scores of tests from norm-reference terms, that is, relative to uh, other children. And instead, we report student achievement now in criterion reference terms. In other words, how many children pass a certain cut point in proficiency. I'm not going to go into it in great detail now. I, I personally think that's a terrible step backwards. I think norm reference reporting is much more informative than criterion reference form reporting. But the, the point that's relevant to this discussion is that clearly how much of an achievement gap you have depends on where you set the cut points for proficiency. And so it's easily manipulable for political purposes to vary your proficiency cut points in order to create either greater or lesser achievement gaps. For example, to take uh, two extreme examples, if you gave a group of fourth graders a test of one-digit addition, all fourth graders would pass and you'd have no achievement gap, no matter what social or economic or, or ethnic group they came from, they would pass the test, almost all of them. And so you'd have no achievement gap. Or if you gave a group of fourth graders a test of solving differential equations, you'd also have no achievement gap. Nobody would pass. The way to get an achievement gap is to set that proficiency point somewhere between the mean achievement of different groups. And in fact, if you want to get the greatest achievement gap, you'll set it halfway between the mean achievement of, of the groups that you're comparing. So that one easy way to show the achievement gap disappearing is simply to lower the proficiency point on your, your um, criterion reference tests. And this, in fact, is happening in many places in the country which are under pressure now to uh, abolish the achievement gap. They're doing it quite effectively simply by lowering the, the proficiency cut point on their tests. So when I'm talking about the, the inevitability of social class impacts on achievement, I am not talking about this kind of politically manipulable achievement gap, which can be established simply by lowering the cut point on the test, but I'm talking about a meaningful gap in the average achievement on high standards of children from different social class groups. Sorry, can I get one? Yeah. And then the third misunderstanding that I want to clear away <clears throat> is a common reaction that uh, people have to this kind of discussion. They say, well, you know, we all know that there are... Um, we all know of, of, of minority children and low-income children who exceed, succeed at very high levels, who achieve at very high levels. There are some minority children, some low-income children who succeed below the, the, the levels of typical middle-class children. And if they can do it, then surely there's no reason why all children can't do it if they have proper instruction. And that misunderstanding is one that... Um, is taking advantage of a temporary, temporary naivete that somehow comes over us when we talk about education and we ignore the reality of distributions and outcomes in any human activity. We would never use that kind of reasoning in any other kind of human activity. Uh, not never. I, uh, in fact, uh, uh, some 20 years ago, in fact, the tobacco industry insisted to um, the American public that smoking must not cause cancer because there are clearly people who smoke who don't get cancer. And we gradually learn to dismiss that as absurd. We all know that there are people who don't smoke who don't, who smoke who don't get cancer, but that doesn't mean that the impact of smoking on cancer, in ca on cancer on average is not very powerful. We all know that there are some people who um, speed and, and don't wear seatbelts in their cars who don't get killed in auto accidents. But that doesn't mean that speeding and not wearing seatbelts isn't a dangerous activity. We all know that not all alcoholics abuse their spouses, but that doesn't mean that alcoholism doesn't predict and cause spousal abuse. Similarly, in education, there are many, many low-income and disadvantaged children who achieve at high levels. That doesn't mean that disadvantage doesn't impact the average achievement of uh, children uh, in school. In fact, there are distributions that overlap, and uh, children at the low end of the um, 
a distribution of middle class children will score below the mean achievement of, of lower class children on average. But the fact that there are that this is not a, an iron determinism does not mean that these causes are not um, very, very powerful. All right, having discussed those three misconceptions, one, that if you talk about the influence of social class on schools, it does not mean that schools don't make a difference. Two, that the achievement gap, when meaningfully described, is a description of average achievement between children of different social class groups on a um, meaningful set of standards, not one that's manipulable by low cut points. And third, that there's a distribution of outcomes in every social group, and when we talk about the achievement gap, we're talking about differences in the average achievement of children from different groups, not the differences in achievement of every child uh, from those groups. Having cleared those three misconceptions away, let me now try to, to present what I called before a common sense case for why uh, social class does influence and can expect to influence, can be expected to influence student achievement no matter how much we improve schools, no matter how high our standards are, no matter how high our expectations are, no matter how qualified our teachers are. First, let me talk a little bit about child rearing. Children from a different social, uh, parents from different social classes raise their children differently. And this has been documented in sociological studies going back for decades. It's not a, a new observation on the part of sociologists who, who observe child rearing practices of families from different social classes. We know, for example, that parents from different social classes, when they read to their young children, read to them differently. Now, of course, we all know it's important to get parents to read to their children. And there's an enormous variation, difference, in the extent to which ch parents from different social classes read to their children, and that's part of the contribution to the achievement gap. Middle class parents tend to read to their children more than lower class parents do. But even if we could encourage, encourage lower class parents to read more to their children, there would be differences in the ways in which parents read to their children. For example, if you take two sets of parents, a middle class and a lower class parent, reading to a three-year-old or four-year-old from a book, the parent who's middle class or who has a professional background is more likely to ask the child, what do you think is going to happen next? Does that remind you of what we did yesterday? What does that remind you of this or that that you, you observed? Why do you think the, the dog or the pony or whatever the character of the book is did that? Those are the kinds of questions that more educated parents are more likely to ask their young children. <coughs> Working class parents are more likely to ask their young children factual questions of recall from the book. What just happened? Rather than what do you think will happen next? What is that uh, object in the book? What do you see there? Uh, this is good reading on the part of parents. It's something we try to encourage parents to do, but we can't overcome these social class differences. Now, why do these differences exist? Well, if you think about it, it's, it's really not very uh, hard to, to understand why these differences exist. If you take a parent whose occupation, whose life, whose professional life is involved in solving problems and coming up with creative <laughs> solutions to problems and collaborating with other workers and dealing with different issues each day, they're likely to talk to their children in ways that mirror the ways they talk and behave at work. If you take a parent whose occupation requires performing routine tasks or following orders, they're likely to talk to their children in ways, again, that pattern the behaviors that they follow every day at work. And it's illogical inconceivable to think that on average parents with very different kinds of occupational patterns are going to talk to their children in the same way and those different ways of talking do translate into differences in achievement. The child who is asked at the age of three what do you think is going to happen next is going to not differ so much in the way in which they achieve in the elementary grades but as they get 
more advanced in school and teachers begin to ask more inquiry-based questions, those children are going to be more familiar with those kinds of questions, more comfortable with those kinds of questions. questions. They're going to be more in accord with their habits of mind than children who have never had those questions asked of them and never had those experiences of inquiry at home. Fifteen years ago, maybe a little bit more, uh, most of you are probably familiar with this, two Kansas researchers did a study, um, probably the most boring study ever done by social scientists <laughs> in history. They went into uh, the homes of families of different social classes with tape recorders, and um, they actually recorded all the conversation they heard, transcribed it, and then counted the words. This is not a PhD dissertation I'd recommend to any of you. But what they found was, was quite startling and not surprising uh, when you think about it, and that is that parents of professional, they, these, these are homes of, of toddlers. They found that, par that parents with professional backgrounds spoke an average of 2,000 hours a word, at 2,000 words per hour. <laughs> that would be a good trick. 2,000 words per hour to their uh, children under the age of three. Working class parents spoke an average of about 1,300 words per hour. Welfare parents, parents on welfare, spoke an average of 600 words per hour. They also found that professional parents issued many, many more encouragements per reprimand to their children. Working class parents gave fewer encouragements relative to the number of reprimands to their children than professional parents, but welfare parents had more reprimands than encouragements in the way in which they interacted with their children. Again, patterning the kinds of behaviors that we know exist in different kinds of workplaces and different social classes in this country. Again, if a child who is used to being encouraged is opposed to being reprimanded when the child makes a mistake, that child is going to learn differently and be able to be taught differently when the child gets to high quality instruction in school than a child who is used to being simply reprimanded when an error is made. And these social class differences can't help but influence the average achievement of different social classes. Now again, what these researchers found, their names were Hart and Risley, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but they certainly found that there were some working class parents who's, who spoke more words per hour to their children than some professional parents. There were some welfare parents who issued more encouragements than reprimands. But on average, there were enormous and identifiable differences in the way in which uh, children were raised. Now, it's not simply a question of child-rearing practices that we can relate almost uh, directly and, and logically to how children, uh, to how parents behave in, in their work lives. There are also very concrete um, differences in economic and social circumstances that affect student achievement. And this is uh, something that I think, again, makes common sense only when you think about it. It's not, as I said at the beginning, that income or skin color affects how much you can learn. But there are characteristics, social and economic characteristics of children that do affect how much they learn. The most obvious health characteristic is differences in vision. We know that low-income children come to school with twice the rate of vision problems that middle-class children come to school with. Now, this is not simply a function, you know, many children get tested when they get to school. I was when I got to school, and I'm sure many of you are, you get to look at an eye chart across the room, and um, that's not the kind of vision problems I'm talking about, although some children have those vision problems. I'm talking about uh, eye training, the, the extent to which children's eyes are trained to track and to focus and to converge, uh, those kinds of eye skills that you need in reading. These are the kinds of problems that lower class children have to a much, much greater extent than middle class children. Why? Well. One reason is probably, a big reason is probably because lower class children have much less adequate in terms of quality child care than middle class children do in their preschool and early childhood years. And that means they get, tend to get parked in front of television sets. Now there's some educational value to watching a lot of Sesame Street, but 
it doesn't compare with the kind of educational and eye training value that you get from uh, more high quality early childhood experiences, playing with manipulative toys, things that develop eye-hand coordination, and so forth. And so children, lower class children, come to school with a much greater rate of vision problems. We don't have optometric clinics in school with vision therapists that typically train uh, uh, children to compensate for those differences. But it stands to reason that if you can't see, you can't read. And the differences in visual skill, in eye training, that children from different social classes come to must translate and do translate into differences in academic achievement. In fact, this particular one probably is part of the explanation, not the entire explanation, but part of the explanation why so many more low-income children get assigned to special education than middle-class children. They are diagnosed as having learning disabilities when, in fact, they probably, many of them, not all, but many of them, have, some, have problems with vision, with seeing, with being able to track and focus and converge on print. Now, that's, a, that's one that directly um, affects education in a way that I think is easy to understand. There are others that affect uh, less directly, but also should be easier to understand. The Surgeon General, a few years ago, published a report in which he found that uh, children, uh, low-income children, had dental cavities at three times the rate of middle-class children. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a, a, a health, an oral health expert, and I don't know really what the, the rate of uh, problems from untreated dental cavities are. But let's just imagine that that uh, half the time you have an untreated dental cavity, you have a toothache occasionally, or maybe often. Uh, maybe some maybe the dentist here can tell me I'm wrong. Maybe it's a third of the time. But let's just say it's half. Well, that to me means if. Um, low-income children have dental cavities, untreated dental cavities at three times the rate of middle-class children, that means that um, uh, low-income children are much more likely to have toothaches on a day a test is given or a day a lesson is delivered than middle-class children. And if you take two groups of children, one of which is more likely to have toothaches than the second group of children, that first group is going to achieve, on average, slightly lower not a great deal, but slightly lower on tests than the group of children that's not detract, distracted by toothaches. That's a trivial one, but all of these small differences in social class add up. What about some bigger ones? Well, one of the biggest problems we face in, in uh, school serving low-income and minority children in this country is high rates of student mobility. Uh, there are many schools in, in big cities in this country where rates of mobility exceed 100 percent. In other words, uh, for every seat in the school in a given year, two children occupy that seat, at least two children occupy that seat at one time or another. I don't care how good uh, your, the quality of your instruction is and how much it improves and how high your standards are, how high your expectations are, if children are moving in and out of the school, you're not going to be as effective in teaching those children as if the children are stable. It's not to say that good teachers can't be more effective with mobile, teaching, mobile children than poor children, but on average, if children are highly mobile, they're going to achieve less. I, I spoke at a class earlier today, and one of the students asked, well, wouldn't this be solved if simply you had the same curriculum in every school? So the children would move from one school to another. They'd get the same lesson. They'd know if this was Wednesday in October, the third Wednesday in October, this is what we're going to learn. And I won't argue that that might not help a little bit. Uh, I won't argue it. That probably won't help, but I, I won't argue it. But we all know that that's not what good teaching involves. Good teaching involves understanding individuals' children's strengths and weaknesses. It, it, knows, it, it involves being able to relate, relate lessons to children's experiences that the teacher is familiar with, uh, much as, as uh, I described middle-class parents before, reading to children by asking them how that reminds them of something that, that happened to them elsewhere. 
So if you have highly mobile children, they are going to achieve less and be able to benefit less from effective teaching than if you have uh, stable children. A, an econometric study by, by Eric Hanyashek, a, a prominent education economist that, using Texas data that was just published, found that if you could eliminate the difference in the mobility rates between black and white children in Texas, that is, if you'd simply reduce the black student mobility rate to the white student mobility rate, controlling for all other factors, you could eliminate one-seventh of the test score gap from that change alone. One-seventh of the test score gap simply from reducing the black mobility rate to the white mobility rate. What about other... Um, <laughs> what about other uh, uh, health um, conditions? For example, uh, asthma, the biggest single cause of um, the school absence, uh, chronic school absence in America today. Middle class children have asthma as well as lower class children. But lower class children are less likely to be treated for the symptoms of asthma. They're less likely to have the inhalators and the other medications that, that uh, are given for asthma. And so they're less likely, middle class children are less likely to, to miss school for that reason. Um, a study in Harlem last year and a similar one in Chicago found that one quarter of the children, uh, black children in, in those two cities, in Harlem and New York and in Chicago, one quarter of them had asthma, symptomatic asthma. Now. It's not only that asthma causes um, uh, much higher rates of absenteeism than children would have if they did not have asthma, but children, even if they come to school, if they've been up wheezing all night, are more likely to be drowsy and more likely to, less likely to be attentive. So this, too, contributes to the achievement gap. Again, I'm not suggesting that any one of these things is responsible for the achievement gap. What I am suggesting is you begin to add up all the differences in social class, behaviors uh, of parents, child-rearing practices, health conditions, housing, uh, unemployment, which is a, a predictor of uh, low student achievement. We know that, that children whose parents suffer unemployment suffer a decline in achievement. If you have a community with higher unemployment rates, it's likely on average to have lower achievement. Each of these accumulates, each of them has a tiny effect on student achievement, but when you add them all up, it explains a good bit of what we worry about when we talk about the differences in achievement of different groups. Now, one of the things that puzzles uh, many observers of, of American education is that there seems to be an achievement gap between black and white students even after you control for social class, or at least that's the way it appears. The achievement of poor black children is lower than the achievement of poor white children. The achievement of middle class children is lower than um, the achievement of middle class uh, black children, uh, black, middle class white children. Do I say middle class blacks are lower than? Yeah, okay. Uh, and people are puzzled. Why should this be? And, and much of the explanation is, is usually attributed to cultural differences uh, between the black and the white communities. We can't, uh, I, I don't think we can uh, completely exclude the possibility of some cultural differences, but much of what appears to be a cultural difference between black and white students is in fact uh, a failure to properly specify the social class differences that we think we're controlling for when we make those kinds of distinctions. For example, when we compare, as I said before, the achievement of um, uh, lower class black and lower class white children, the blacks have lower achievement. But in fact, the only way we know how to compare that in this country, virtually the only way we know how to compare that is by looking at their eligibility for free and reduced price lunch. And so what we're really saying is that white children who get free and reduced price lunch score higher on average than black children who get free and reduced price lunch, free or reduced price lunch. And as you may know, um, free and reduced price lunch eligibility goes all the way up to 185% of the poverty line or about $35,000 a year in income for a family of four. White children who receive free and reduced price lunch on average are much more likely to be at the 100 towards the 185% end of that range than black children who are more likely to be at the 
poverty end of that range. That's not to say that all white children are at the top of the range and all black children are at the bottom. But on average, poor white children are not as poor as poor black children. Poor white children are likely to be poor for short periods of time in the year in which the achievement gap was measured. Poor black children are more likely to be permanently poor. So when we compare poor white and poor black children, the poor black children are much more likely to have all of the other characteristics that I was talking about before of lower class children than the poor white children are. And we're not really talking about a cultural gap. We're talking about a difference in social class that's not measured simply by looking at children based on their lunch eligibility. Same thing is true of middle class children. Middle class black families in this country in this year in, in this decade, are much more likely, given our history, to be the first generation in their families to be middle class than white families who are middle class. White families who are middle class are much more likely to be the second or third or fourth or more generation. And that has consequences for the economic circumstances of those families that's not picked up, consequences that are not picked up by simply looking at their current income in this year. Black families who are middle class are much more likely to have non-middle class relatives with whom they have to share income. Black families who are middle class are much less likely to have contributions of assets from their parents who are not middle class. White families who are middle class are more likely to get contributions of down payments on their first home, for example, than, than black families who are middle class. In fact, what the data show is that while black median family income is now about 62% of white median family income in this country. Black family median assets are about 8% of white median family assets. So again, we're not talking about um, children of similar economic circumstances. And this also has an effect on the achievement gap, not a giant one, but some. A child who knows that his family or her family can afford to send him to college or her to college is likely to approach school in a different way than a child who knows that his or her family cannot afford to send him or her to college. Discrimination also plays a role. Um, some uh, critics at this point of view argue that there is uh, no longer any discrimination in the society. But in fact, uh, what we know is that, that uh, young people with similar education if they're black, have lower earnings than whites unless they have college educations. At college educations, the earnings dis, uh, disadvantage disappears, but blacks with similar achievement and educational attainment to whites have lower earnings uh, because of more labor market discrimination. Again, if children were perfectly logical, rational economic actors, if a group of children is going to get less payoff from education than another group of children, rationally they will put less effort into their education. Again, a tiny bit. All right, now where does this all lead? The first place it leads is that not as some people who have reacted to my book as saying that we don't need to improve schools. Clearly, schools are an important part of what produces student achievement, and I would never suggest that better schools cannot narrow the achievement gap. But in addition to improving schools, we've also got to improve, if we want to narrow the achievement gap significantly, we've got to improve the social and economic circumstances that I described that also contribute to gaps in achievement. If we follow a policy, as we're following in this country, of expecting schools to be the sole actors in raising student achievement, we are bound to fail. If we expect schools without taking account of any of these other things, to close the achievement gap, we are bound to fail. And if we set a goal, as we have in, in present law, of saying that schools alone will be solely responsible for closing the achievement gap, and indeed will do it by 2014, we are setting up for schools for an inevitable failure, and I think undermining public support for schools by promising to do something that schools can't possibly do. So, thank you. People can't see. I'd like to start with a couple of points of agreement first. Uh, this is a book, by the way, that you should read if you haven't. Um, there are a, a lot of points in the book with which I agree, but I'd like to focus on three. First, there is lots and lots of evidence, as Richard said, that there are 
Social class differences that influence achievement. He didn't give you all of what's in the book. Those of you who are in your second year here read, or at least were asked to read, the Hart and Risley book before you came here. Those of you in your first year here ought to go read it. There are six copies, I think, upstairs. I didn't find it boring. I just found it enormously depressing because it provides painful quantification of the enormous difference in vocabulary acquisition as a function of social class, and it shows the parental behaviors that are correlated with that. But there are others that I think you didn't mention. There are studies going back a long time that show, for instance, class differences in discipline strategies, all sorts of aspects of parenting. So like it or not, this is what we're faced with. Some of what Richard pointed out people are comfortable with. No one is too bothered by conversations about class differences in child vision. But people get very uncomfortable when you talk about class differences in the home linguistic environment of kids. That doesn't alter the fact that they exist and they're consequential. Uh, a second general point of agreement that is more abstract is that what Richard has done is in some ways very atypical of modern social science. If you read a lot in social science, you'll find people saying things like, kids in single parent families don't score more poorly on achievement tests because they're in single parent families. It's because those families tend to be poor. Well, that argument and its, and its uh, converse are both kind of silly. People don't do poorly in school because of the number of parents in the home or because of the wear and tear on their clothing. It's because of things that affect their cognitive development directly. In the case of single parent families, it might be, for example, how much parental time is available to children. In the case of poverty, it may be the things that, that Richard pointed to. The point I'm making is that to un unravel uncomfortable group differences in performance, we have to look at things much closer to the child's experience than these broad social categories such as class or, or race or whatever. We have to look at the factors that could directly influence cognitive development, and that's one of the real contributions of Richard's book. Um, I do have a few disagreements. Um, oh, and one other major point of agreement. I, I certainly agree, and anyone in my class knows this, that the notion of that we will solve this problem and make the gaps close by making schools accountable for it is nonsense. It just isn't going to happen. Uh, it may be that if we did it right, we could do things in schools that would narrow the gap somewhat, but we're not going to make it away, make it go away. But I do have several points of disagreement as well. Um, first, I don't think you can be so confident about the causal direction between, um, say, occupation and other economic factors and, and parental behavior. For instance, Richard gave the example that it's logical that people in lower class jobs would speak differently to their kids. It's also logical that people who don't have a, a lot of verbal ability aren't going to become lawyers. It's not clear what the causal direction is. What is clear is that there are strong correlations between these aspects of, of background and student performance. I'm also uncomfortable with, uh, that I don't entirely disagree with, uh, Richard's disparagement of the role of culture. Uh, I'm not specifically talking about the role of culture in black-white differences, but there's a lot of evidence, unfortunately not the evidence some of us would like, that culture has a profound impact on group differences in performance. And if you'd like an interesting case, another book that ought to be upstairs, if it's not, tell me and I'll make them buy it, um, is a book by Nathan Kaplan with a C called Children of the Boat People a study that was done some years ago looking at the, the performance and environments of children from non-literate Asian communities, Asian immigrant communities. And what it found was very predictable uh, cultural patterns, things like uh, emphasis on education as a way of getting out of the life that the parents were in, insistence that the kids delay gratification in order to lead a better life, insistence that older uh, siblings help younger siblings with their homework and so on. The problem is that in the evaluation of culture is very hard to do. It's very subjective. It's hard for people like me who do quantitative things to be comfortable with. I trained originally as an anthropologist, but nonetheless, um, judgments of culture are, well, first of all, culture is very hard, hard to define, but judgments of culture are inherently more subjective. But nonetheless, I think it's a mistake to, to uh, rule culture off the table. There are lots of group differences that are less controversial than the black-white difference that seem to be in substantial part influenced by culture. Um, one other point of half disagreement is that however important these social class factors are, and I don't think we know exactly how much their contribution is, it also is becoming reasonably clear that even without them, 
we would be confronted with enormous variation in human performance. That's just the way people are. They are every place anybody has ever looked. Uh, and if you, the most, the simplest place to look, the, the closest to us right now, is to look at international s studies of, of student performance, which show massive variation in student performance, even in societies that are vastly more homogeneous and equitable than ours. That leads me to the same implication that I think that Richard was drawing. Regardless of what we do, and actually a bit of an aside, Richard has in his book a, an estimate of I think $152 billion uh, uh, for so uh, non-school interventions that might address some of the factors that, some, some, some of the factors that are in the book. Well, over the next four years, we're not likely to see that happening. Um, but even if we did, the fact is we have to figure out educational policies that will accommodate in some reasonable way wide variations in student performance. We don't have them. What we did when I was the age of most of you in the room is we ignored them. I didn't, but I mean, people in the education policy world just said, well, that's the way it goes, lower class kids are poorly, et cetera. What we have now is an education policy that pretends that they'll all go away. What we don't have is a sensible way to put realistic amounts of pressure on the schools serving low achieving groups of students. Something that policies will force those schools, and I actually disagree uh, to some extent with Richard on, how, on the correlation between class and school quality, but something that will, will, will force or at least encourage schools serving low achieving groups to do better without setting targets that are not only unrealistic but self-destructive. Good evening. A different look at the achievement gap. I'd be naive and wrong, which is a combination I don't like very much, to think that educators alone can change the picture for what is now the new majority entering the school door. There does need to be significant policy change around health, around economic issues, housing, around teacher certification, around dual enrollment, on and on. Schools need partnerships. They need partnerships with post-secondary educations, with cultural institutions, with non-profit, um, with businesses. Schools now have to seek their own funding to pay for a, f a productive, non-traditional school time. This is on the school. But because I was in public education for 35 years, I believe the molding or the demise of a new generation of the holders of knowledge happens in schools. Kids who fall into the achievement gap category are well described, documented, labeled with predictions about their futures and with all of this information supported by rich, accurate data. So for educators, it's not that they don't get it, it's that they don't know what to do with it. The problem with what happens in schools has never been the achievement gap kids or any kids at all. They enter the doors of school like any other kid, different colors, speaking different languages, living at or below the poverty line with varying levels of preparedness to face the academic challenges inside. It's inside those walls for a time of six and a half to eight hours a day that the problem begin and the achievement gap legacy of failure is exacerbated. It takes a plan to educate underserved kids to make up the difference for years of lost time in school, for years of being undereducated and underserved. During elementary school, kids of color often never see a teacher who looks like them or a school leader. Cities across the country report mismatches between student and teacher demographic from a high of 95% mismatch to a low of 50%. Kids see white middle class people who do an adequate job evidently of raising their own kids or at least can remediate situations when their kids need services. At this young age is where black or brown meets authoritative white. Often behaviors are misunderstood. Implicit, implicit teacher direction is, becomes piercing, loud, and confrontational. Cultural differences are unknown or misunderstood and the downward spiral for the gap kids begin. As early as kindergarten, kids are oversubscribed in special education, in kindergarten, as compared with the school population. By the high school years, black kids are suspended and expelled at a rate of more than three times higher than the school population, and Latinos at a rate of two to four times higher, depending on the city, than the school population. In high school, the gap kids are still oversubscribed in special ed, many isolated in behavior modification classrooms and undersubscribed in college or honors classes and seriously undersubscribed in AP. 
Damage control with an entering ninth grade student emerging from this picture is bleak. This ninth grader will enter with a cumulative record of behavioral infractions, but little or no data on academic deficiencies or strengths. No plan for remediation, no plan to build on their strengths. This student will fulfill the achievement gap prediction. Now we can just all sink in depression after what I just said or understand what it takes to change this picture and see the happy ending here, because we all are in education. Change is about getting the problem and knowing what to do about it. It's about the school leader, because in schools that change the gap legacy, and there are examples of them all over the country, there cannot be, in this one case, a fa failure of leadership. The school leader has to be resolute to defy the underperformance syndrome and have a plan. Successful results occur most often in small schools or small learning communities with open student enrollment, not chosen student enrollment, and at least some degree of autonomy. Successful school leaders have done research and understand the entering population and share that information with the staff. They use entry-level data to see the students' strengths and weaknesses. They recognize the need to build relationships with, with their partners in the community, post-secondary uh, institutions that are near. They need to involve all staff, students, and families, the community, to co-create a vision for the school. In many of these schools, preparing all students for academic rigors of college is prevalent. And this belief is underscored and clearly understood by students as they're often placed in non-tracked classrooms. In this school, personalization and relationships between staff and school leaders are essential and inextricably linked to student performance. Literacy across content area is emphasized the school leader, and any visitor with that school leader will see evidence, students reading, writing in every area, portfolios, journals, rich dialogue in every classroom. This is a school that builds a team where teachers become instructional leaders. Teachers observe one another. They talk to each other about the lesson. Professional development becomes so embedded in the everyday workings of the school that you can't even recognize it. Teachers seek way to engage these students, research that works best with them, and develop strategies that work here. The school leader and any visitor will see classes with 100% student engagement kids riveted to the teacher because these young and veteran teaching professionals are sharing their love for what they teach. The school recognizes a need for non-cognitive activities and builds programs around community service and internship activities, all with accountability measures built in. Step into me for one minute and then I'll finish into the seventh grade English class. Teacher's reading a picture book to her class because the class population is typical for the school. Many English language learners, kids of colors, all with reading skills three or four years below grade level. Their eyes barely blink, fearing they might miss one facial expression of the reader. The teacher finishes, puts the books down, and asks the students for evidence of personification in the text, imagery, tone, setting, and the oral workings of kids mastering basic and advanced skills simultaneously will amaze you. Step into that 10th grade class. Can it be that these were the same kids we just saw in that 7th grade classroom? This class rivals those at Andover Academy. Cognition that was so difficult to cultivate has morphed into metacognition as you speak to these students who step outside of themselves to analyze their own learning. Then you travel to AP courses, which are students selected in this school, students who think they can do it. And they're amazed at the content and the student enrollment. You speak to juniors and seniors about the university classes they're taking. You visit the Gothic literature class taught by a college professor in the basement of the school. Talk with her about this being the defining moment of her career as an English professor. And if you're fortunate, you're there when the alumni return to talk. The kids, the kids who are now sophomores in college, who came from this background. The black valedictorian of the class who's now a brown who overcame tremendous obstacles. The three Latino kids at Clark University doing well. The kids whose working mothers made, made no more than $18,000 a year enrolled in, as sophomores in college. In schools, you have the power to change generations, often beginning with picture books. Kids go to school to learn. That's what they know. They know when they go to school, they want to learn. Educators need to be prepared to take this gap on. Thanks.
number of different fragments of comments to make that uh, trying to figure out how to make flow. I'm not sure I can. Um, this, this, I agree this is a, a book that is worth reading. Um, it's, for me, though, it's, it's sort of halfway between journalism and scholarship in some ways, though. It, it goes back and forth between the two. Sometimes it's very careful to give you really good references for things. Other times there's a grand generalization backed up with one reference to a, to a secondary source where you don't know quite what the data was or, or what to make of it. And so, um, but if, if you held the book to the strictest standards in this regard, it, it, it couldn't be out by now because it would have taken too long to give really thorough references on the broad range of things that he tried to cover. And for a lot of these things, we just have not done the right research to, to know the answers with much, with much certainty. So, um, but if you wrote the book in a way that acknowledged that all through, it would seem too wishy-washy because you'd have to put too many conditional statements and, well, it might be this and it, it may be that. So um, the things that make me uncomfortable about it, but I'm not sure the way that it's written might be the way that it will produce the greatest value. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Um, the big question that is prompted by the way Richard started, he says we, we just can't do it. Well, the question is, well, then we should, should we stop even talking about closing achievement gaps? And my answer to that is no. <laughs> it's still an aspiration. Uh, we shouldn't build into law requirements such that the sky falls if we don't do it by some critical date. But it is still an aspiration. Um, the big question, how much difference can improving schools make or trying to improve schools make or working to improve schools make? How much difference can it make if we don't do much new and different with SES uh, problems? I don't think we know the answer to that at all. It could be a big number. Schools can make huge differences to our closing achievement gaps even if we don't do much with SES. Or it might be that schools can't do very much if we don't do much with SES. There's no way to know really from the existing data. Just because it's a long list of socioeconomic factors does not mean that the effect sizes add up to some huge effect size. Uh, we just don't know um, on that. Uh, it is in fact the case that we did make what I regard as huge progress in narrowing achievement gaps from the 70s into the 80s, and it was not during a period of massive SES change. If you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress uh, numbers for 17-year-olds, we cut the reading score gap by almost two-thirds in a 17-year period and most of that was com concentrated in even a shorter period uh, without any massive social change uh, during the 70s. Progress stopped at the end of the 1980s. It correlated in time with the social shift for black teenagers. It included a plummeting of leisure reading for black teenagers and uh, a drop off in class attendance. Uh, it happens to be that it happened at the same year that, that hip hop took off commercially, but that may have nothing to do with it. Um, <laughs> But uh, we did make a lot of progress for reasons we don't totally understand. Uh, progress stopped, it turned down a bit, or went flat, depending upon which test score series you look at. But we really don't know uh, what the magnitudes are here. It's not clear that shifting a lot of our time and attention and resources towards dealing with social issues um, is a better use of resources than continuing to use those resources for school improvement. Uh, I could argue either side of it because we don't really have whoever gets the burden of proof loses um, <laughs> on this one because we really don't have the data to to establish it with any certainty. Um, I don't know how, the degree to which we can successfully teach parents to interact more effectively with their kids even without giving them better housing and higher incomes. Um, it's plausible to me that we can go quite a distance with helping parents to learn how to pose questions to their kids and reminding them how important it is to talk frequently and actively with their kids and to give their kids certain types of experiences and to push at the community level for various kinds of enrichments in the summers and on weekends and so on that don't cost a whole lot of money but do require this if folks decide that they want to do it. Um, so again, I just am not sure there. It's also plausible to me that gradual improvements in school effectiveness over an extended period of time will lead to gradual social class uh, improvements. Uh, the causation runs in both directions with regard to most of the things that, that we talk about. Um, I will not argue that we have a lot of great models to point to 
for school improvement um, approaches that are proven to work reliably over and over again in lots of different places. I will argue that there are lots of ideas on the table that people are, are working with right now that have the potential to be reliably effective if we just uh, stick with it for uh, a long period of time. So the book makes, makes me a bit nervous if it were too influential that it would, it would kind of, it's a kitchen sink approach because you've got, got to deal with everything because everything causes everything and we can't make progress, progress on anything unless we deal with everything. Um, and obviously that doesn't work. We can't, can't do that. So, um, so I think the, it, the book does a service to call our attention to the fact that this is a really hard challenge. And the way that we often talk about it is unreasonable. We're not going to narrow these gaps um, over the period of 15 or even 20 years so much that we can say we've, we've closed them or we've succeeded. But um, the fact is, if we admit it, we really don't know right this minute what the best approaches are to use to make progress. And it's OK for us to disagree. And everybody works on what they think is important over a period of time. Um, how am I doing on time? You're OK. I'm on time? OK. Uh, there are a couple of, um, I write poetry for teachers um, that I recite when I, when I talk to teachers. And when I talk to teachers, by the way, I, don't, I keep parents out of the conversation because I want to talk about schools and not social class issues and so on. Um, but there are just some, one that in the, intended to promote empathy on the part of teachers is called Hardships and Distractions. And it makes the case that the book makes in a lot of ways that there are all kinds of hardships and distractions that interfere with school, but if teachers understand these things better and accommodate more for them, that might make some difference. Um, it goes as follows. I'm going to have my dinner at my grandma's house today. My mom is staying late for work to make some extra pay. I got a lot of homework, but I'm worried about my mom, so that makes it hard to concentrate. My mind feels like a bomb. <clears throat> I've also got to make sure that I wash some clothes to wear, and I got to get the stuff I need to tame my crazy hair. And while I'm doing that, I'll use the phone to make some calls to tell my friend, friends the time and place for Friday at the mall. And sometime between now and then, I've got to get some dough, because I ain't going to the mall all destitute and poor. I know I should focus on that test I've got in math, but my English papers do soon, too. I need some help real bad. Some teachers think I just don't care. Some think, I think I'm not trying. I think I'm caught in a trap. Sometimes I just start crying. But no one ever sees my tears, because I just show the tough side. I like to seem real in control, if not book smart, then streetwise. I wish my teachers understood what it's like to be me, to see my life the way I do, the whole complexity. They'd see how hard it is to keep so many things in focus. They'd see how blurry things can get, how stuff can seem so hopeless. My teachers said I best be ready when I take that test in math. But I ain't got no help at home. I never knew my dad. I want to go to college, but for that I need good grades. And based on what my grades are now, there may not be a way. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need someone who's wise to help me figure out which way to turn, to empathize. But let me stop daydreaming, because I've got a lot to do. If I don't start my homework soon, I never will get through. If I try and still can't do it, then I just won't hand it in. But if I don't try, I'll never know. So here goes. I'll begin. Every day I pray to find someone to guide me and to care. Is there any chance that you could be the answer to my prayer? I'll do one more. It's uh, called Transformation. It's about where we are and where we want to be. Um, I, started kindergarten two or th I started kindergarten two or three big steps behind. Some classmates understood things that had never crossed my mind. The kids who looked real different seemed so smart, I can recall. Those who looked and spoke like I did didn't seem so smart at all. Of course, there were exceptions. But mostly any day, it was clear those kids are doing best, and we were just OK. Our teachers liked them better because they always knew the answers. So kids like me just tried to be good athletes and great dancers. The years went by quite slowly. Most things just stayed the same, till our principal decided it was time to change the game. She hinted that the reason when those other kids did best was that many knew already more of what was on the test. They'd learned it from their parents and from things they did at home much that I and my companions never had the chance to know. That had always been the pattern. Yes, for years it was the same. But the standards movement came along to finally change the game. Now that there's a new prescription for the way our school is run, everybody's got new goals to reach. It's getting to be fun. We're learning to get smarter, because our teachers show us how. They're all serious about it. Everyone's important now. 
Time in class is so exciting that we seldom fool around. We might make a joke in passing, but we quickly settle down. After school, we do our homework, often in our study groups. When we need them, we have tutors, and they give us all the scoops. If there's something that's confusing, it's a temporary thing, because the teachers love to answer all the questions that we bring. All the counselors and teachers work with parents as a team, because they share the same commitment to connect us with our dreams. I love the way things are now. It all just seems so right. We still play sports, and we still cool. But now, we're also bright. That first day of kindergarten, some of us were way behind. But today, I'm graduating in a truly different time. So I'll stop with that. Great poem. Bob gave me permission to respond in prose. I, I wish that weren't my only alternative, but <laughs> that's where I am. Um, uh, thank you to the three of you. I, I, there's not much that I disagree with in, in what, what was just said, but there are a few points that I would, I would like to, to make. Um, I think the main thing I want to emphasize, again, which I hope came through before, but is worth emphasizing again, is that when Ron said that people could draw the conclusion from my talk or, or my book that we can't make progress on anything unless we deal with everything. That is not uh, the message that I'm trying to convey. What I'm trying to convey is that we can't solve the problem by dealing with only one thing. And that if we try to pretend that we can solve the problem by dealing with only one thing, we are going to set ourselves up for failure. We are going to undermine the legitimacy of public education in this country. And we are going to demoralize great and good educators who are trying to do the kinds of things that Ron and Donna both described. Ron said that it's not bad to have an aspiration of closing the test score gap. And I think that is something with which I disagree. It is bad to have an aspiration that is so totally unrealistic that you have no way to measure whether you're doing the things that could be done with more realism. Uh, I, I don't mean to get overly political, but it's a bad thing to have the aspiration that we're going to create a perfect representative democracy in Iraq. If we were more realistic, we might be able to accomplish something rather than set ourselves up either for a total failure or a total success which is impossible. And the notion of closing the gap, and by the way, I, I, am, I, I am at fault for, for sometimes talking loosely about whether I'm talking about the social class gap or the racial gap. I think it's much more likely that we come, can come quite close, if not completely uh, close, uh, completely achieve closing the racial gap, meaning that poor black children will score as well as poor white children. Poor middle class children, black children, poor <laughs> middle class black children will score as well as middle class white children. That is a more realistic aspiration. But the notion of suggesting that lower class children who are disproportionately black in this country will score as well or achieve as well as middle class children is an unrealistic aspiration, and it's one as I said probably too many times, it sets us up for a failure that does great damage. Some people argue that, well, if you really tell the truth, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what they say, this is not the way they say it, but if you really tell the truth about the multi-causal relationships between educational quality and social class differences and economic policy and achievement, that people will simply use that as an excuse. And it will let them off the hook, which is the phrase I always hear. You're letting them off the hook. I don't think it's an acceptable policy to keep people on a false hook. People have to have realistic goals, and they have to be able to measure, be measured towards those goals, and they have to know when they're successful. We have, we, we've seen this um, recently in our, our public policy as the, the Bush administration is now uh, – putting out and states are putting out these lists of failing schools. There's no distinction between schools that are good and schools that are poor. They're all failing. 
And the reason that we can't distinguish between schools of the good and schools of the poor is because we've expected all of them to achieve something that they can't achieve. And if we had more realistic goals for schools, we, we would be able to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. The other point I want to make is that there's no country in the world, no industrialized country in the world, that like the United States expects all social policy to be concentrated on school reform that expects all social problems to be solved by school reform alone. That is the, the, where we've come to in this country. It's not a place, by the way, that we've always been. It's a place that we've come to in the last 20 years. And the reason I wrote this book is I wanted, I didn't know where to start, where, where one starts in trying to break that, um, uh, that false theory, but it seems to me that educators have to do more than do the things that Ron and Donna so eloquently described. They, of course, have to do those things, but they also, because they have an, an, a unique insight into what produces differences in student achievement, educators have to be people who are become spokespeople for social policy as well as educational policy. If educators don't do it, who will? Who else has the experience with children of different social classes who can testify to the extent to which both their efforts and external factors affect how much those children achieve. And so the primary audience for this book is probably educators whom I'm trying and I hope will speak up not only for better school practice but also for better social and economic policy so that we can truly make steps not to close the gap but at least to narrow it in significant ways. Uh, I won't take waste your time by comment, responding to every other thing that was said, but, but thank you, all three of you. Thank you all. Uh, now it's your turn. Um, there are two microphones. Um, let me just um, put in a plea to uh, keep your comments short. Uh, and uh, if you want to address your question to, uh, to Richard or one of the uh, other panelists, please do so uh, directly. Um, so the floor is open. Uh, there's a biblical phrase, uh, the meek shall, shall inherit the earth. Although I'm not a Christian, but I believe it. And the reason I believe it because the meek can find innovative ways to make change in their own lives. I will just give an example of in, uh, India from where I come from. That the business people, they have a community. And that community in the last 15 years, it is going down. And in the next 50 years, it will be nowhere because people who are based on their education, they are improving. Now I'll give an example what Professor Ronald said, that, for example, the technology, people who are poor here, they are very rich compared to people in the poor countries, for example, India and China. And the poor... poor do, you do you have a question? I'll just have a statement to make and maybe a question for Professor Ronald. Question, question, please. Okay. So the question is, if people, if the students are given career, better career avenues and if they are able to find educational opportunities outside the country which, are, which they can afford, for example, if they get a computer science engineering degree from China or India at a very less cost, can't they do better after coming here? Thank you. Do you understand the question? No. Can you try to rephrase it? Or? I understand. I'm sorry, I didn't really understand the question. Can you try to rephrase it? Uh, as you mentioned that the people who don't have much money here, the low-income people, they're not able to, first of all, have a good graduate degree in the high school level, and afterwards they're not able to graduate to a top-class college in the Sophomore or some other higher, good private college, they're not able to get in and get a good graduate degree in any technical field. So if they use some innovation, they can get a good graduate degree somewhere else and start working here, and they will be able to uh, close that achievement gap in the terms of their educational level and income level also. Do you disagree with that? Well, I think that the, you would be right. If, if there was no achievement gap by the time children graduated from high school and the only thing that uh, prevented them from uh, going to college was differences in the affordability of college, then, then perhaps uh, going to another country to get a college education might be a, a feasible solution. But clearly there are big achievement gaps uh, that we've been talking about by social class before children graduate from high school. Uh, so 
suggesting that they get a college education somewhere else won't make them eligible for high college, which is the fundamental problem. Right. Yes. Thanks so much. Um, my question is about interventions. It seems like interventions, especially for at-risk kids, are getting, um, are getting oriented earlier and earlier, especially, for example, in early education, more and more uh, universal acts being passed by states. It seems from the summaries of, uh, on the research on parenting in your book that almost implicitly you're arguing um, that we should start looking, that maybe there's not a best style parenting, but there's better styles. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of programs like Baby College that was brought up at the Harlem Children's Zone, for example, that have been getting a lot of interest. What do you think about either these programs as, you know, an ideal way to start addressing the gap and also as politically viable? Thanks. Why don't you just take it from there? Um, I wouldn't say that there are some parenting styles that are better than others. I'd say there are some that are more predictive of academic success than others. And there are... Uh, many other goals of, of child rearing than academic success. But if we care about academic success, which we seem to and should in this country, then there are some parenting styles that are more effective. In the book, I describe one thing, and I'll say it, uh, uh, just describe it real briefly. This is not the, the idea you're talking about, whether it's not your specific program, but the idea of doing more, and this is the, the probably the most, single most important thing we do, more in the way of early childhood, high quality early childhood programs. Um, is, wasn't illustrated any better than by um, Susan B. Newman, who was President Bush's Assistant Secretary of Education from 2001 to 2003. She was the person who was responsible for, for um, uh, uh, implementing and shepherding through the No Child Left Behind law, and unfortunately we don't have a tradition in this country of protest resignations from government. So she resigned quietly in the, at the end of 2003 and wrote a, an article in, in Phi Delta Kappen, which I recommend all of you read. And what Susan B. Newman said is that without denouncing her past, her own past, she said, look, we all know that the reason that uh, children perform differently is not because of the soft bigotry of low expectations. It's because these differences exist by age three. And if we seriously want to close the gap, what we need to do invest in early, is invest in early childhood programs which have high-quality professional caregivers, meaning well-paid professional caregivers for infants and toddlers, and very, very high adult-to-child ratios, so children can start to have the kinds of early childhood experiences that middle-class children have. I'm not talking now about pre-K, which is four, four-year-olds. I'm talking about early childhood programs. Children, I'm not and I'm also not talking about taking children away from their parents. These are children, children who are already away from their parents in low-quality daycare centers or being cared for in, by neighbors or grandmothers. And if there were high-quality early childhood programs available to all of them, they would get more of the kind of intellectual stimulation that would be uh, conducive to high achievement. So I agree. Why don't you just stay there? <laughs> yes. well, the call, question me for me. Um, my, uh, my auntie, I see from England, and my auntie runs a school, elementary school, um, that's in a Muslim community, 80% Bangladeshi and Pakistani, first and second generation. Everybody's very poor. English is a uh, second language for most of them. Uh, it's basically in the ghetto. It's a really, really bad school. When she went there, was, everybody did really badly. Basically, she's turned it around five years, and now everybody, every, it's the, one of the best schools in the city. And the way she did it was just to change the curriculum, get people interested in what happened, get, get, got everybody interested in the education. And these are, these are basically at high risk kids. And all she did was just reconceptualize it and get them interested in learning. So look at the deficits they had, worked on those deficits, and now it literally is one of the best schools in the. So it's one of the best schools in the city. So my question basically is, is are you really suggesting that we can't educate poor children? It's because they had this certain deficit. So sure, sure we just need to do different things to educate them. But to be honest, getting a high school diploma isn't, isn't all that hard with the right, with the right resources. Well, I, I, all I can do is, is uh, repeat what Ron Ferguson said. We don't know how much of a difference a focus on school reform alone can make. There's no doubt it will make some difference. But we have no way of knowing how much of a difference it makes. I think it's not going to make as much of a difference as, as you propose. Well, can I go into that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, the, that you're missing one of the lessons of Richard's books which is that it's not poverty per se that's at issue. It's certain things that, are, at least in this country, actually in most countries, are correlated with poverty, which means that some poor kids 
have backgrounds where, for example, the linguistic environment is, is relatively deprived. Many poor kids do not have those environments. Um, yeah, so, with this particular community, like I said, they are, it is English second language, and it is really, like if you look at Muslim, the Pakistani Bangladeshi community is one of the worst, and for the language, definitely, I can guarantee that most of these children are coming from backgrounds where they do not. He has not produced the environment for these kids. Well, what yes, but what I'm saying is I'm not, I don't know that community, but there are many communities, including many where the kids are both poor and not native speakers of English, where the kinds of disadvantages that are outlined in, in, in Richard's books are, are not, in fact, all that severe. I don't know that this is one of them. But, yeah, but, but the general point I'm making, because I don't know that school, is that Richard's book is not arguing that poverty per se predicts these things. That's exactly what it is not arguing. It is arguing that certain things that are correlated with poverty are more common in poor communities do predict. That's a very important distinction. Yeah, but um, Ron, but, you want to jump but, in? But he's arguing that his aunt's school is an existence proof for the proposition that someone can go into a very disadvantaged community and provide conditions at school without changing much in the parents' so socioeconomic environment well, we make a huge difference. And we don't know the school. We aren't exactly. necessarily arguing it. It can't be done ever. Right. The question is, can we do it well, dependently at scale? Right. Right. Don is too modest to say it, but her, her presence here also tells us that we, we have examples that, uh, that uh, uh, these odds can be overcome. That does not diminish this, the question of whether or not on average or at scale uh, this can be done without affecting uh, the other uh, conditions as well. Debbie Meyer. And um, <clears throat> even though I like to say that I uh, changed the odds, in fact, um, in schools that I've been associated with, which did very well, <clears throat> We did not, in that sense, change the odds. That is, um, schools in Westchester didn't have to have lots of the conditions that we had to fight very hard for. Uh, they could be, so to speak, a mediocre uh, Winnetka school produced greater results. I got the kids into college, but not the same colleges mm -hmm. that they got them into. They got good jobs later on, but not the same jobs. So the gap uh, is partly. I just. Um, uh, I'm thinking of some of the comments that I, and you know where I'm probably going to disagree. <laughs> and that is that all of you use as the measure of achievement and as the focus of achievement test scores as the shortcut way of our just saying whether what we can and cannot do. And um, I think that exacerbates the issues that you're talking about. You know, when, um, who was it who made that nice statement that some kids, uh, your poem. When some kids, uh, what was that? Uh, new things that we didn't know. I, you've said it much better. Uh, the fact of the matter is, there were the things the teachers picked up on were the things that some kids knew well and other kids didn't know well. So that's one of those changes in schools that uh, can have some of the effects they're describing. If a school meets children, on the basis of their strengths and their family strengths rather than on their weaknesses. So one of the reasons I'm so disturbed that we keep using the word for achievement test scores <clears throat> is that it increases that tendency to look at the, quote, academic things, uh, which we simply mean good use of your mind, uh, that uh, show up on tests, which have a long history of, uh, of being designed around class differences. Can, can so I respond? I, I just think that using tests as the, the only, that narrow way of looking at it, uh, which I think uh, is my only long-term argument with uh, several of the speakers up there, uh, has distorted the, our sense of what that gap is and has certainly made it more difficult uh, to undermine it. I, I want to respond because I think Richard would give too long an answer. <laughs> <laughs> Richard's actually a Richard actually on spends this. a lot of the book arguing your point, right? Um, arguing the tests are not as important as we treat them to be, and that what he calls non-cognitive skills are, yeah, know, are more important. But he nevertheless accepts the argument that is in proving his very point. The thing he has to use is achievement tests, and I, oh. I'm, what I'm arguing is that we we get caught on this that it's our definition of achievement. Well, can I, uh, Ron, first of all. In 1990, I dropped um, a test score into an hourly earnings equation and knocked out half the black white hourly earnings gap. And from there on, I was interested in test scores. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
The black white hourly earnings gap was about 20 percent. The black white gap in armed forces qualifications test scores in the, in the uh, National Longitudinal Survey of Youth is about a standard deviation that predicts about 10 percent um, uh, wage gap difference. Now, there are lots of differences that test scores don't predict. By no means are there everything. But um, they do measure skills that employers care more about now than they cared about 30 or 40 years ago. And so that's one, uh, among the reasons we care so much. But I think nobody up here is going to argue that they're, only thing, they're the only thing that matter. Um, and so on. Richard, do you want to? No, I, I, I won't, I won't ex expand on Ron's interpretation of my remarks. He did quite well. <laughs> Please. Thanks. My name is Ben Piper. I'm a doctoral student here. My question is about some of the institutional um, kind of factors that change achievement in schools. And uh, I'm, I'm particularly referring to the work of John Ogbu, his last work on uh, upper, well, upper middle class um, uh, socioeconomically uh, kind of continual uh, school that had both black and white students, where you saw almost a one-point gap in GPA. And I, I know Dr. Ferguson's work throughout the country on these kind of schools that are both um, upper middle class and have this disparity between achievement between uh, diff the different racial groups. And my concern is that your solution doesn't get at the systemic problems within schools that work to, to, to create that situation. Because these are schools, and I know some schools where I grew up too, that the, stu the teachers were, were and, uh, they would say that they were concerned about this gap, they weren't trying to perpetuate it, yet there's something within schools that creates situations where with be controlling for, uh, excuse me, controlling for SES, controlling for all these other factors that you mentioned, you still see serious differences, one point GPA differences, between people of, of uh, black and white uh, heritage, Latino and white, et cetera. So my concern is where in your, uh, in your work do you deal with that? I don't deal with it because lots of other people are dealing with it. I don't deal with it not because it's unimportant, but because I think that there's such a uniform uh, press in our dialogue today that says that uh, the kinds of things that you're addressing are the only problems that exist, that somebody needs to speak up and say not that those aren't problems, but that there are other problems too. And we have got to look at a variety of causes and solutions if we're serious about addressing this gap. So I don't disagree that those things are important. I do think, though, that some of the things, as I said before, some of the things that you're describing are in fact social class gaps because we poorly specify social class differences. But there's no doubt that there are some things that remain of the kind of, and that they need to be addressed and should be addressed. Thank you. Anybody else want to run? Do you want to respond to that? No, I just agree that some of the differences are social class differences, even though they don't appear to be that way. And even these, I'm usually able to predict about half of the GPA gap using SES gaps uh, in these kinds of school districts. Eloy. My question is that in, it seems that I've been here for three months and every course that I take in terms of everything that was in, intuitive coming in as a classroom teacher, oh, like inputs is going to make a difference in closing the achievement gap or everything else that you can think about. In every class, I get a different take. So uh, in Mr. Rothstein's books, it did talk about the Tennessee uh, star experiment that worked, and we learned about that in the economics. But in economics, from the standpoint, you know, Eric Handyshek puts forth this argument that you know it doesn't really matter, but I know Professor Ferguson has done some work in, um, in Alabama that I read about in Peter Schrag's book. I'm just a little confused because not necessarily confused, angry and frustrated because we're here at the ed school, we're talking about it. If I were to take that information and, and to the, the average person who might not know what the achievement gap is, you know, what, what is one to take in terms of like input in classroom? Where Eric Handyshek argues that it's not really good, but economists like Professor Ferguson have stood and said, you know what, it does matter a lot. And the intuitive reason is, yeah, class size ratio, it's like political suicide if anyone wants to take it away in California. But I guess this question is generally um, directed towards Professor Ferguson, if you could uh, enlighten us a little bit more on, on your argument. Well, I should first point out that, that pretty much everybody agrees teacher quality matters. Okay, measured in a number of different ways. Handyshek agrees. Uh, I agree. Lots of people agree with, with that. Um, there's not a lot of debate there, except there are different ways of measuring and we can measure it better, get a better handle on it. With regard to class size, we've never done the research well enough um, and the right research projects to resolve the differences in perspective. So um, 
under the assumptions that particular researchers make their findings are correct. Now, in the two large data sets I've worked with, I do find class size effects. But those effects have not been replicated across another other, enough other subjects to really establish my findings as, as, as the right answers. And I'm not arguing that, the, that, it, that they should be regarded that way. Uh, the consensus is that class size matters through the end of first grade. Then after that, um, we get disagreements because they didn't put kids in Tennessee Star back in regular size classes till fourth grade. Hanasek doesn't think they needed to be there after first grade. He's not even convinced they need to be there even through first grade. Um, other people are speculating. It's really a speculative difference. So the answer is that we haven't done the research in the right way to know for sure on these, on these questions, particularly with regard to class size. Hi, my name is Kamsi, and I'm from California, and I'm a former algebra teacher and a current student here at um, Hugsey. My question is that while I don't necessarily agree with the tenets of No Child Left Behind, and I know that mathematically 100% of students being at the proficient level with a high level of proficiency is virtually impossible, and that the manipulability of proficiency levels, state by state or AYP by AYP, is obviously a contentious issue. What is an appropriate goal? Because my claim as a teacher leader at my school was, if we don't set the stakes, the aim high, we'll never meet a high goal. So my question is, while 100% might be mathematically impossible, and nobody here is saying that you know, we can achieve that, I'm hearing from Donna and maybe from the poetry from um, Ronald that I'm, I'm feeling them as a person, that they feel like excellence is possible. As a professor or as a leader of an institute like where, um, uh, I forget what it's called. University Park. University Park. Maybe there's more realistic goals where you have to go through it in a more implementable way. But I feel like excellence, and especially with this young man from the school, the excellence school where his aunt changed the school, what's the appropriate goal? 90%, 80%? What, what do we shoot for? That's a... Uh, that's a dang Good last question to give each of you an opportunity to respond to that or also just use it as an opportunity to make any last comments you want to make. Dan, we'll okay. start with you. Um, what, I, I, what, what is a realistic attainable goal here? Uh, first, I think the idea of setting large-scale goals, goals based on individual cases, schools where things seem to be going extremely well, is a very bad idea because those, the most successful schools um, don't have typical staffs. Uh, you have to really, well, you know this. All right. What we ought to be doing is we ought to be, and for the people in my class, I apologize because you've heard this time and time again, we ought to be looking for some actual evidence about what can be accomplished. And there are lots of different kinds of evidence you could look for. You could look at large-scale interventions that have been tried before. You could look at historical data. Bob Lynn um, at the University of Colorado suggests that we take the schools that seem, say, the top 10 percent of schools, the schools that are making the most rapid improvement, and set that as our target, assuming that very few schools, if any, will do better than that. What we've done instead is we've made up numbers out of whole cloth. And they're truly ridiculous numbers. They're not just slightly odd. They're rid ridiculous. We, we've set standards that are absolutely impossible to meet. And what that does is not only set us up for failure, it gives teachers incentives to do things we don't want them to do. Because if they don't meet these goals that are impossible, they get punished. So they'll find shortcuts for meeting them, which means that the kids will in the end get cheated. So what we ought to be doing is finding some rational, empirical basis for figuring how much improvement we can expect in a school. And that's going to vary from one school to another. A school that has a very high transience rate is not likely to be able to make the kinds of improvements that a school with a stable population makes. So given not only large-scale historical data and research data, but knowledge of individual schools, we have to set targets that are modestly above all the time where they are. That's not what we're doing. We're just making it up. Donna? Just a little practitioner data here. Um, if we don't set high standards in schools, who will? Where they work? Who? Uh, at University Park, the ultimate goal is not to pass. Well, first of all, we have to pass the MCAS test for them to graduate. So is that a little bit of a goal? Yes. Because the ultimate goal is that they'll all be prepared to do college work, that they'll all go to college, which they all have, uh, and, and be able to do the work there. Um, so on a standardized test, if the kids don't score proficient or advanced, 
they're not able to do college level work. That is the bottom line about testing. So do I think and do the teachers think they all have to? We do. And have they all? They have. Uh, Teaching to the test is not an issue there. These are skills that they have to have to move ahead. Ron? If, if we get to the time, maybe 2050, when whites as a group are a minority, just like everybody else is, and non-whites collectively are the majority, and we look around and um, apparent access to opportunity and influence in the society is still as lopsided as it currently is with regard to the position that whites occupy. We're gonna get some really strange politics, like in Malaysia where Chinese dominate, but they're a minority in the society. So it's, it's important that we work toward the goal of having people in different identity groups distributed through the social class hierarchy in a more even way than is currently the case. When I talk about it's an aspiration to resolve achievement gaps, I'm frankly not talking about social, socioeconomic achievement gaps. I'm talking about racial and ethnic achievement gaps. And the, my aspiration is that over time, the distribution of different racial and ethnic groups through the socioeconomic hierarchy will become more and more even, and that achievement within across racial groups within social bracket will become increasingly even. Um, now, in utopia, maybe we could go even further than that, but um, I think it's, I don't know how achievable it is, <laughs> but I think it is a reasonable aspiration to have people whose parents have the same amount of education have very similar test scores. We're not near that even now. Uh, it is a reasonable aspiration to have acceleration um, in upward mobility, more from some groups than others. Um, when we started, Bob said, well, the test score, the lines look the same between blacks and whites, except that it's 17-year-old blacks and 13-year-old whites. Well, that's not true if you look over the last 30 years. If you go back into the 70s, 17-year-old black kids were doing worse than 13-year-old black kids. By the late 80s, 17-year-old black kids were doing better than 13-year-old white kids. Right. Then there was some black backsliding. It moves around. Low SES and high SES black kids made more progress, faster progress, than low SES and high SES white kids for a period of, of 10 to, to 15 years. And so that's the narrowing that I'm talking about. And so looking at racial gaps within SES brackets um, is among the things that I look at to calibrate progress. And so we have long-term goals, we have short-term goals, and we can break it up into small bite-sized pieces. And it's not just one goal, it's goal. It's a whole trajectory of goals over a long period of time. Richard, you get the last word. Well, no, I, I really don't disagree with anything Ron just said, so you can have the last word. <laughs> uh, great. My last word is please join me in thanking the panel for a very lively discussion.